Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 94. And I want to start just by reading the psalm for us. This may not be one of the ones, one of the psalms you're most familiar with. So it'll be good for us to hear the whole thing to start. So follow along as I read Psalm 94, which says, O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth, repay to the proud what they deserve. O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? They pour out their arrogant words, all the evildoers boast. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. And they say, the Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive. Understand, O dullest of people, fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord, knows the thoughts of man that they are but a breath. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law, to give him rest from the days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people, he will not abandon his heritage, for justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Can wicked rulers be allied with you, those who frame injustice by statute? They band together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of refuge. He will bring back on them their iniquity and wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord our God will wipe them out. That's a good way to end your song. That's going to have them walking out, snapping their fingers. <laughs> the Lord our God will wipe them out. This may not have been the psalm you would have picked uh, if you're looking at the ones from 91 to 100, but I chose this because exactly for that reason, because it is less familiar to us, but it's not insignificant. I mean, it is part of the inspired scripture that we have. And so it is profitable, just like all other scripture. And also, a verse 11 here is quoted in 1 Corinthians 3.20. And verse 14 is referenced in Romans 11, 1 and 2. So apparently the Apostle Paul knew this psalm. Seems like we should too. I also chose this psalm because it seems uh, so relevant. I mean, look at what's, what's happening he talks about in verse 5 about believers being crushed by evil, wicked, arrogant people. It talks about the helpless being slain in, in verse 6. In verse 17, he seems to describe the fact that he is in some kind of life-threatening situation. And in verse 21, it talks about how the innocent are being condemned. And this appears to be all happening under uh, rulers, lawmakers, judges, maybe even the king was involved in this. Some people think that this was uh, written during the time of King Manasseh, the most wicked of the kings in, in Judah. We don't know that for sure. In fact, we don't know who wrote this psalm, and we don't know when it was written, but it, it seems to me like it sounds pretty contemporary, like there's a lot of wicked stuff going on uh, in, in that day that we can relate to. The other thing I like about this psalm is that it's so raw and real. I mean, this guy's not holding anything back. Uh, I, and particularly verse 3, O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? And, and we need to know that that's an okay question to ask. Uh, it, you see it here in this psalm, and I'm going to show you some other places where you see it in the psalms. This is a pretty common question 
recorded throughout the Scripture. In Psalm 13, uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, O long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? That that's, it seems like this is a, a pretty common question. Psalm 74, uh, verse 10. Be another example. Oh, how long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff, is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Uh, uh, like, how long is this? Why aren't you doing anything, God? Psalm 79, uh, verse 5 says, How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? <laughs> Keep hearing this question, don't you? How, how, how long? How, how long? You. You might, be, you might have asked that question a few times lately. How, how long is this going to go on? Uh, Psalm 89, verse 46. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Uh, how much longer do we have to put up with this? And, and in case you're thinking, yeah, that's Old Testament. Those people didn't know any better. Well, let me show you Revelation chapter 6. And these are, these are people in heaven. You think they know? Okay. One person thinks that they know. <laughs> I'm hoping I can convince the rest of you here. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10. Well, first let me just read verse 9. It says, Then when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How, how long, Lord? So... That's a common question. It's a question you might have. It, it, it's, it's raw. It's real. This is, this is what we like about the Psalms, is that it reflects real people in real life experiences. There is a book I would recommend, but you can't find it anywhere unless you have lots of money. And it's a little book. It's called Meeting Ourselves in the Psalms. And that's what we do. We meet ourselves. We can relate to what the psalmist is saying, what they're experiencing, what they're feeling. We can relate to all of that. This is what we call, Psalm 94 is what we call a lament psalm. The psalmist is lamenting his, his situation. And so apparently that's okay, because there's a number of these lament psalms. Psalms, and there's even a whole book called Lamentations, which was Jeremiah's hit song. It was on the radio all over, all over Israel. And, and the issue that this psalm is going to bring up to us, the question that this psalm is going to force upon you and me, is will I believe what God says even in wicked days? Will I believe what God says even in wicked days. Uh, in order to affirm that, uh, you, you're going to need to remember three realities. And we'll work our way through this psalm and, and uncover those realities that we need to keep in mind if we're really going to believe what God says even when things are going bad. And, and number one is in verses 1 through 11. I think you have it there on your handout that you need to remember that God sees the wicked. Now, there's wicked people doing wicked things. God knows all about it. We can easily think at times that it doesn't seem like God sees what's going on. In fact, that's what the wicked are thinking. That's what they're counting on. Uh, that's what they're saying in verse 7, the Lord does not see. 
That's why they feel so confident and so free to do what they're doing because God's not seeing this. God's not doing anything. And, and that's their conclusion is because we don't see anything happening, then God must not see, God must not know, we're okay. But that is not so. God does see exactly what they're doing. And, you know, when you just start off these first two verses where it says, O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up, O judge of the earth, repay to the proud what they deserve. That could sound kind of harsh. That's kind of, is that the way, really the way you wanted to start your song here with, with uh, calling for God to bring vengeance on them? But you need to remember that vengeance is not the same as revenge or being vindictive. That's what you and I do. We, we act out of revenge. We act uh, vindictively. That's not what it, the call is here. To, to avenge means to uphold law and justice. Think of the avengers. Isn't that what they do? They uphold law and justice. Uh, that's, that's the idea. It's calling upon God to uphold what is right. And here's an important thing for you and me to notice is that the writer is leaving vengeance in whose hands? God's hands. He's leaving it in God's hands. He's not wanting to take it out on him by himself. He's leaving it in God's hands just like God instructs us to. Uh, in fact, in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35... You, you read that instruction from, that's given from God, 32, 35. says, vengeance is mine. That's what God says. Vengeance is mine and recompense. Or another way to translate that would be, and I will repay. Vengeance is mine and I will repay. For the time when their foot shall slip, for the, the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. God says, I'll, I'm going to, Bring vengeance, and I'm going to bring it in the right way. By the way, that verse right there was the text for a very famous sermon. Uh, probably the most famous sermon ever preached on American soil. Who knows what I'm talking about? Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Which I... I, are you sure that's the title you want for your sermon? <laughs> are you going to put that out on the sign in front of your church? Come on in, everybody. Come on in, all you sinners. Um, but that's, that's where this comes from. This is God saying, and, and you know that that's repeated in, in the New Testament. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, verse 17 says, repay no one evil for evil. Repay how many people? No one. That's the instruction for us. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And then verse 19 says, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. There he quotes Deuteronomy 32, 35. So uh, that's, that's hard for you and me to do. It's hard for us not to want to repay in some way. Now, we may have, have limited abilities to make anything happen, but we can sure say evil things about evil people. We can sure slander them. Uh, we can sure talk about them. Uh, in inappropriate ways. And so we know that it's hard to do, so that raises the question, will you believe God? If he says, vengeance is mine, I'll take care of it, are you, are you really ready to believe him that he's going to do what he says he's going to do? And you'll notice there too, it says in verse 1, uh, asking God to shine forth. Uh, asking God, make yourself known. Make yourself known in the midst of this dark, sinful world. He's asking God to bring justice and repay the proud 
what they deserve. And then in verses four through seven, he, uh, he lists their transgressions. They pour out arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. It's not only do they do evil, but they boast about it. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They're, they're, they're uh, against God and everything associated to him. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless, the people who uh, are unable to defend themselves. Today, there's something that we could add to that list. They abort babies. And they say, oh, the Lord doesn't see. They think that, that God's going to let them off the hook, but the, God, but the writer here wants to remind them of some things. He, he says in verse 9, who planted the ear? You think he can't hear? Who formed the eye? Don't you think he can see? Uh, he, he, he corrects them there. Um, by reminding them that God does hear, God does see, God does know. And when he calls them fools, there in verse 8, fool in the Bible simply is a reference to somebody who lives in disregard of God. I, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. And so it's not saying that they're stupid or uh, anything like that. It's not, a, it's not a judgment on their IQ. Q, it's a, it's a, a statement describing their behavior. They, they live in disregard of God. So a, as you look uh, around at a world that seems out of control and seems like it's running as fast as it can after every sin imaginable, a world that is proud, a world that is wicked, a world that is arrogant and foolish, just remember that God sees every single sin and every single sin will be paid for in full. Nobody is getting away with anything. Just because we don't see it happening right here, right now, and the way we would want it to be done right here, right now, doesn't mean it's not, it, they're getting away with anything. Nobody gets away with anything. Every single sin ever committed will be paid for in full. And either you're trusting in Christ and his sacrifice on your behalf that he paid for those sins for you, or you will spend all of eternity paying for them yourselves. But every single sin will be paid for. God is a God, a holy God, a just God. Every sin will be paid for. He's not overlooking any sins. He's not letting anything get by. Every sin will be paid for. And the psalmist is simply asking God, uh, to do that, to bring about vengeance. So, we're going to live in this world. You just need to remember uh, God sees what's going on. He, he doesn't need the internet. He doesn't need CNN. He, he knows. He knows what's going on. He sees everything. He sees things that you will never see. He hears words that you'll never hear. He, he hears and sees it all. So that's, that helps us as we live in this wicked world to know that there is a God of justice and he will act. Second thing we need to remember is found in verses 12 to 15. And that is that God blesses his people. Even in the midst of a wicked world, God uh, brings blessing to his people. It says, Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law, to give him rest from days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people, he will not abandon his heritage, for justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. So there's the assurance right in the middle of this psalm that God blesses his people. And as you look at this, you might think that God 
he, he blesses, but not in the way we might think he, he would or the, maybe not the way we would like him to. But we need to understand what it says. It says he blesses us by disciplining us and teaching us there in verse 12. The idea there is that God is in the process of training his people. Discipline and teaching, that you put those together, it's God's training his, his people. And he will sometimes use wicked people and difficult circumstances to do that training. Now, does the wicked person th think that that's what they're doing? Hey, Christian, you should thank me because God's using me to train you. <laughs> that, that's not what they're thinking, but that's what God's doing. And see, there's the amazing thing. You can talk about God's sovereignty, and you're going to hear a sermon, if you haven't already, about God bringing the people of Israel through the Jordan River, and, and you would think that's, that's an amazing thing. But what's more amazing is that there are, I don't know how many billion people on the planet today, every one of them doing whatever they want to do, and God is using every one of those independent actions to fulfill his purposes perfectly. When you think about it that way, making the Jordan River stop is pretty easy for God. How, how, how does he oversee things in such a way that his purposes are being accomplished so that his people are, are being blessed in the midst of all of that. Uh, that's an amazing thing to consider. That's because we have an amazing God and we should be amazed all, all, all the time. He, he uses all those things. The discipline of a hard life, which is what the writer's describing here, it causes us to turn to God and to learn more from him. And that right there is a, good, is a good thing. That right there is a blessing. In fact, in Psalm 119, let me just read you this one verse, in verse 71, Psalm 119, verse 71, the writer says, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Why? That I might learn your statutes. Because see, the affliction is used by God to drive us to himself and to drive us to his word. That's a good thing. The end result of that is good. So let, let's, let's look at these verses here and think about some of the things we, we learn. In verse 13, it says that the result of this discipline, this teaching, this training, is that it gives rest in days of trouble. He provides rest. We, we draw closer to him and we find rest for our souls because as we go to him and we learn from his word, we get clarity on the situation around us. We, we understand the big picture. Uh, we, we understand that there's an end to this and it gives clarity that provides us rest within our souls. We can rest in the fact that our God hears what's being said. He sees what's going on. He, he's not unaware of what's going on. In Psalm 49, 5, it says, Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me? Well, yeah, why should I fear? If, I, if I'm being drawn closer to God, I'm learning from him, I'm getting the big perspective. I don't need to be fearful of what's going on around me. The second thing that we learn through this discipline is in the second half of verse 13, we, we, we learn that the wicked will not last. A pit is already being dug for the wicked. And so we know that these days, they aren't going to last uh, forever. They're going to come to an end. In chapter 10, verse 2, it says, In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. Yeah, they're going to get caught. And a lot of times they, they bring it down on themselves in a painful way. Chapter 18, Psalm 18, verse 27 says, you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. Uh, they, don't, they don't get to stay haughty forever. Nobody 
who's experiencing eternal judgment is feeling haughty or arrogant anymore. Uh, Psalm 147, verse 6 says, The Lord lifts up the humble, but he casts the wicked to the ground. So see, God is disciplining me. He's training me. He's helping me to understand things. He provides rest for my soul. And I learned that the wicked, they're not going to last. This is not going to last. A third thing there in verse 14, it says, For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. Uh, that, that reminds me, this discipline and training reminds me that God is always with me. He never forgets me. Might feel like that at times, but... Uh, you know, we're not trusted in our feelings. We need to know what's, what's reality, and the reality is God's, God hasn't forgotten me. And again, this is, you see these themes throughout the, throughout the Psalms. Uh, we, he, we will not be forgotten. We have a hope. Psalm 918 says that. Psalm 1012 says, Arise, O Lord, O God, Lift up your hand, forget not the afflicted. He doesn't forget. We can trust in the fact that God is with me. He knows what's going on. He's not forgotten about me. And uh, verse uh, 15 here assures us that uh, he will triumph in justice. He will triumph in justice. You know, Christ is coming back. And he's going to establish a righteous kingdom. That, that, day, that day is coming. You know, if you were to hear a rabbi over in Israel, some of you went to Israel. If you were to hear a rabbi, a rabbi in Israel talk about why they don't believe Jesus is the Christ, they would say because he didn't finish the job. He, he didn't take over and establish a kingdom. And that's when you want to remind them, he said he's coming back. And he will come back. Psalm 2, verse 8, uh, this is God talking to the Son. He says, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Uh, that day is coming. He, he's going to establish his kingdom. And you know, it's helpful every once in a while when you're, when you're in times when things seems like wickedness is out of control, it's good just to go and read the end of the book. So let's do that. Let's open up to uh, Revelation 19. And let's just read the end of the story. This is not, it's, this is not like reading a novel and it's cheating to go look read the end ahead of time. Oh, this is there to help us. Maybe... Uh, Maybe our crack tech crew back there could bump down the air a little bit. Is it getting hot in here or is it just the heat of the word? Uh, all right. Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh is a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come for, and gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who is its, 
who in its presence has done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake that fires with burr, with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came out of the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So, you know, the book of Revelation might be confusing to some, but here's, here's all you need to remember. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Some of you that uh, went to Israel, you saw the uh, Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon. Looks like a great place to have a battle, doesn't it? And that's, that's what's going to happen. They're going to be gathered there to fight against Christ as he comes back. And his army doesn't have to do anything. He, he wipes out the enemies. And then it goes on into chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Those are the people back in chapter 6 saying, how long? Well, the day is going to come, and they're going to be reigning uh, with, with Christ. He, he is going to win. He will triumph in justice, and he will establish a righteous kingdom here on the planet. So this wickedness, it's not going to last forever. And God blesses his people. It's a blessing just to know that. That, that is such a great blessing to be reminded in days when it seems like wickedness is out of control. It's not going to be like this forever. Jesus is coming back. And we should be eagerly looking for that day. Amen? Amen. Would it be okay if it happened today? Yes. Even if we didn't get to go to the 4th of July parade? Yes. You're sure about that? Yes. Uh, okay. All right. So God, God blesses his people. He trains us and he uses these difficulties. Uh, that These difficulties, in fact, are designed by God to mature his people. It's important for us to remember that these aren't just random things happening out of control. No, there is a God who's in control of all these things and he's using them for your good. The question is, will you believe what God says even in wicked days? Will you believe it? That he, he sees it all, he hears it all, and he's using it all to train his people to find rest in him and confidence in him. He sees the wicked and he blesses his people. This good so far? Well, we're just, now we're just getting to the good part. That was like the appetizer. <laughs> because the last section here, verses 16 through 23, we're going to see, we're gonna, we need to remember that God's character provides hope for us. This is why I had you do the discussion question, what attribute of God gives you the greatest sense of security? Well, he's going he's gonna to go through a list of things here with that purpose in mind, that it gives us hope. A couple of weeks ago, we did a whole, a whole lesson on hope and the importance of true hope, true hope that's based on God's word and God's character, not false hope that's based on my feelings or anything else. It's solidly based on God's character. So let's see how this plays out. In verse 16, he, he asks another question, which apparently is an okay question to ask. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? That's the question. And it's a good question, especially if you follow up with the right answer. Verse 17. If the Lord had not been my help, 
my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. Who, who's going to stand up for me? The Lord stands up for me. He, he's my help and he's my hope. He, he's my help in, in, the, in the day, this day, and he's my hope for the days to come. And so here the writer expresses his faith and his confidence and his trust in, in the character of, of the Lord. And this is an important thing that I want to keep reminding you of when you read through the Bible. Yeah, we meet ourselves in the Psalms, but the question you should always be asking yourself is, what am I learning about God? What am I learning about God in the Psalms? What's it, what's it revealing to me about God? his glory, his greatness, his majesty. What am I seeing about God in, in the whatever scripture I'm reading? And Psalms is a great place to be asking that question because so much is said, and that's what we'll see here. Look at, look at what he says about God, who is his help and his hope. He says in verse 18, when I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. So here, here's one character of God that he thinks about, God's steadfast love. Steadfast love of the Lord continues, fill in the blank, come on, interactive Sunday school class, forever. Steadfast love of the Lord continues forever. That's steadfast love, you could say it's loyal love. That talks about the stability of God. Uh, he, he keeps his promises, he's loyal to his word, he's loyal to his people, and he will hold me up. My eternal security is wrapped up in him. No one can take my soul away from him. They can kill my body, but they can't disconnect me from God. No, nothing can do that. And... and and again, the Apostle Paul, who quotes from this psalm, he, he really understood that. We're going to be seeing this uh, sometime when we get to it in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're taking a little break from Romans now, so I can, I can read this to you now because you'll forget it by the time we get back to it. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 35. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, he's going to give a list of things here, and here, here's the thing you need to understand when Paul makes this list. This, for him, this is not a hypothetical thing. For you and me, it would be. For the Apostle Paul, this is like every day. So he, he's, he's experiencing these things, and he's asking, can any of these things separate me from the love of Christ? He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. Those are some pretty heavy contenders. But he says, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Sure, as Christians we should expect this kind of treatment from a wicked, God-hating world. So are, are we, are we going to be defeated by these things? Is it going to are these things, can they separate us from the love of Christ? His answer is in verse 37, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I, I love that, more than conquerors. Conqueror is a translation of a word that some of you have on your shoes. Uh, Nike, or Nike in the Greek, Nike. And... Uh, and this more than conquerors is hooper nike. It's like hyper conquerors, super conquerors. We are super conquerors in Christ, which means we don't just barely win the game by a field goal at the last second. It's a runaway from the beginning. We are more than conquerors. We're super victors in Christ. He says, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us 
from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, God has made his love for us evident in sending his son who loved us and gave himself up for us and nothing can separate us from him. His steadfast love continues forever. Nothing can separate us from him. And he says, for I am sure. See, that, that's the issue. Are we going to believe what God says even in wicked days? Paul is saying, no, nah, I'm sure of it. I'm convinced. I'm believing it. So the steadfast love of God is one thing he points out. Look at verse 19. This is a great verse. It says, when the cares of my heart are many. Does, do, you ever, do you ever have many cares going on in your heart? One honest person in the whole room. Many cares. He says, when the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. So here's the thing about it. It's God's encouragement. God's encouragement is what gives us hope. Not only his steadfast love, the fact that nothing can separate us from him, but his encouragement. I have cares but his encouragement can cheer up my soul. Do you really believe that? Will you trust him with your cares? Will we cast them all on him? That's what he invites us to do. First Peter 5, 7, he says, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. And if we believe that, we're going to be casting our cares, our, our, many, our many cares on Him. We're going to be rolling them off onto Him and finding encouragement and consolation from Him. You see, the answer to the problems in our world are not political, they're not medical, they're not educational. They are spiritual. And God is the one who gives us hope. Um, look with me at Psalm 119. And we, we don't know who wrote Psalm 119, but if you read through it carefully, whoever it, it was was feeling heat from people in high positions. And we'll see that in verses 23 and 24, where he says, Even though princes sit plotting against me, so there, there's, and that's what's happening. He's not, he's not, this is not a, you know, even if this were to happen, no, this is what's happening. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Is that what you're doing when people are plotting against you? Meditating on God's statutes? Uh, I, might, I could probably think of a few other things I might be doing. He, and why does he do that? He says in verse 24, because your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. They are my counselors. If, if there were princes sitting plotting against me, I mean, I might be tempted. The first thing I might be tempted to do is let everybody in my fellowship group know all about it and know all about how they are wrong and I am right and you guys should, you guys should defend me uh, uh, on this thing. Now, I'm not saying you don't share your cares with your fellowship group, but they are, they are sad counselors compared to God's testimonies. See, that, that we have to believe that God's word has the answers. Otherwise, we will turn to other, other solutions uh, for our encouragement. So th this is God, we, we need to remember uh, God's character, and that's what gives us help and hope in wicked days. We remember his steadfast love, we remember his encouragements that come to us through his word. 
And look at verses 20 through 22 for another one. It says, Can wicked rulers be allied with you, those who frame injustice by statute? They band together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. And here it talks about how the wicked band together against the righteous. And it might even imply that laws are being made against the righteous. Here they, they band together against the righteous, but the Lord provides for us a stronghold, a rock, and a refuge. That, that speaks of safety. That speaks of strength. These, these people can do anything they want to against me. I, I know somebody stronger. You know, they always say it's who you know that makes the difference. And it helps to have uh, people in high places that you can call on. Well, we've got the person in the highest place that we can call on. And he provides us safety and strength. We saw that last week in the sermon in Psalm 142, uh, where the, the psalmist wrote, I cry to you, O Lord, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. You're my refuge. You're the one I can find safety in. And you're my portion or my inheritance. And if I have you, I have all, all I need. You provide strength. You're my rock. You're my refuge. You're my safe place. And he is my refuge. He is my portion no matter where I am. And the writer of Psalm 142, David, is hiding in a cave when he wrote that psalm. Because the king, Saul, wanted to kill him. So we can find help and hope in remembering God's steadfast love, remembering his encouragement, which is found in, his, in the word, and looking to God's strength. Uh, and, and what he does there when he says that... Uh, you're, you're my stronghold, my rock, and my refuge. He's just piling up words here to emphasize that God is, has provided a safe place for me. He, safety in him is, is the best place. Even though there might be laws designed to hurt God's people, they are not stronger than our God. I think we need to stop from time to time and just remember the strength of the Lord and consider the evidence all around us of his mighty power. Like, let's do that for a minute, interactive uh, Bible class. What are some of the evidences around us that remind us of God's mighty power? The ocean. The ocean's pretty big, isn't it? It's pretty powerful. Yeah, that, that's, we take it for granted. The church is evidence of his power in saving, bringing dead people to life. What else? The sun is evidence, yeah. Stars. Answers to prayer. What's that? Birth of a child. There's also things like earthquakes. Have you guys ever experienced anything like that? An, earth, an earthquake? Lightning? Hurricanes? Yeah, you know, people like, we, we lived in, in uh, Texas. And, and these people, they are, they're fascinated by earthquakes. How could you live there with, when there's earthquakes going on? But there they, they have hurricanes that come in off the Gulf, and they have tornadoes. I mean, it's, it's a pretty weird thing when you turn on your TV and there's a tornado watch warning going across the bottom of the screen. You're going, what? Tornadoes? Uh, and, and see, the thing is with a tornado and a hurricane, you, you, everybody gets on their TV and their computer and they watch it coming right, right at them. <laughs> to me, that's a lot more horrifying. I, I tell them, hey, most of the earthquakes I've been in it's over before you even figure out what's happening. Come on. 
I thought you Texans were tough. <laughs> yeah, all those things are evidence of his, of his power. He, he tells the lightning what to do and where to go. Yeah. So think about his power, his strength. And then verse 23 uh, it says, he will bring back on them their iniquity and wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord our God will wipe them out. That's remembering God's justice. We have the assurance, the absolute assurance that God will make all things right. Nobody is getting away with anything. God will make all things right. So again, the question is, will I believe this even in wicked times? That's the issue for us. We could read the psalm, we could say amen, but in real time, are we going to believe it? And I just want to show you one thing, because I think this is interesting. There is a parallel between this psalm and uh, one of the prophets. Uh, his name is Habakkuk. And uh, since we're into things that we're not as familiar with, like Psalm 94, let's go to Habakkuk. You, you might not have been having your devotions in Habakkuk recently, but Habakkuk's in a, in a similar situation. And the same question is brought up here. The book of Habakkuk, right after Nahum, <laughs> he's a fine right before Zephaniah it's right there Habakkuk you know when you hear people in other languages say some of the names in the Bible like in, in Brazil Portuguese it's Habakkuk -y. I kind of like that they add E's to the end like we're going to go have a picky nicky and we're going to play some pingy pongy Okay. Uh, Habakkuk, he, he had a problem. Starting in verse 2, chapter 1. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? Does that sound familiar? How long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Oh, or cry to you violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous so justice does not goes forth perverted. Uh, and so he's talking about bad times in, in Israel, particularly bad times in Jerusalem. Wickedness is abounding in Jerusalem. God, what, what's going on here? Why aren't you doing something about this? Well, here, here's the Lord's answer. Verse 5 says, Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that you will not believe if, if told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. He says, I am, I am doing something about it, uh, Habakkuk. Here's my plan. Babylon's going to come and wipe you guys out. And so you, you get the classic what from Habakkuk in response to that. Look at verse 12. It says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? He's saying, how can this be, God? The Babylonians, they're even worse than we are. How can you be using them to come wipe us out? And, and God assures him he's going to deal with Babylon too. Nobody's getting away with anything here. And the key to this whole book is found in the second half of verse 4, chapter 2. The righteous shall live by faith believing what God says. That's what we do. 
We, we live by faith. We believe what God says. That verse is so significant that it's repeated in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. The righteous man lives by his faith. He's not just saved by his faith, he lives by his faith. And so... Habakkuk learns this lesson from God. So by the time you get to the end of the book, he's singing a different song. Verse 17, chapter 3 says, So the, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no fruit, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. So in other words, if everything completely falls apart, Yet, verse 18, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. So see, he's got questions. He's living in wicked times, and he's, he gets the assurance, oh, it's going to get worse. It's, it's about to get a whole lot worse, Habakkuk. But by the end of all of this, Habakkuk is praising the Lord, trusting the Lord, and finding his strength in the Lord. And the key there is the righteous man lives by faith. Will we believe what God says even in wicked times? That, that's the key for you and me living in these wicked times Will we believe what God says and will we find our strength and our hope and our consolation in Him? Or, or are you going to look somewhere else? That's, that's the question. We are called to live by faith, believing what God says. Does this make any sense? Does this sound like contemporary stuff? <laughs> Sounds like every day. Yeah, any, any questions? Comments, criticisms, corrections? Yes, sir. So you read Revelation. Are you saying that Revelation is saying that the saints that are in heaven are still in uh, how long? In, in Revelation 6, that's exactly what it says. Yeah. Yep. How long? Yeah, I just read what it says, and that's what it says. Uh, yep. Yes, ma'am. Um, verse 19, at the end, it says, He makes me tread on my high places. What, what does that mean? Well, so you were in Israel, right? And there's lots of mountains and cliffs and stuff like that, and there's a kind, uh, deer might not be the best translation there. there there's a, a kind of a mountain goat over there, it's called an ibex. You might have even seen an ibex over there. He, he's saying, you, you make me like the ibex who can climb up the side of a cliff, which is a pretty in incredible thing to behold. Um, so that's his high place. Yeah, so they, they, they are able to go up where nobody can get them. They're safe, they're secure, and, and that's how the ibex wins. <laughs> You want to mess with me? I'm going up this cliff. Hey, you, you can't follow me. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, you know, when you think about it, like even what we talked about today, this is a lament psalm, and he's lamenting all the wickedness that's going on around him. But when you think about it all the way through like we just did, nobody's getting away with anything, that should compel us to tell people the gospel. Because you're living like God's not seeing what you're doing. You're living like God doesn't hear what you're saying. He does. And, and, and it's not going to turn out well for you 
you, you, need to, you need to repent now and put your trust in Him because He is a, a holy God, a God of justice, a God of wrath, and every, every sin will be paid for. The good news is He's provided a Savior to, who took that wrath. No, it is totally appropriate for us. We should be saying, God, bring justice because we want God's name glorified. We don't want it for our sake. We want it for his sake. God, shine forth. God, shine forth is what the psalmist said. We want your glory put on display, and his glory is put on display just as much in judging people as it is in saving people. Well, they're living like that. They're, he calls them fools. They're, they're living like there is no God. Yeah. You might know a few people like that in, in Huntington Beach. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Psalm 94. We learned some things from an unfamiliar psalm that seems like it's very contemporary. Yeah. Let me, let me pray for us. Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for uh, how contemporary it is because it does, does come from the mind of an infinite God. And we are thankful that we have this clear revelation from you. Help us to think through the wicked times in which we live. And so, Lord, I pray that we might remember these things that the psalmist brought up we might apply them to our own hearts and our own situation and that we would find our comfort and our encouragement and our hope in you, knowing that you're, you're a God who does what's right. So Father, thank you for this time and we thank you in the name of our great Savior, amen. amen.